This is, this is probably one of my favorite parts of the program, and that's because the last two years I got to sit up here. And the reason I got to sit up here was because I convinced my prosecutor at the time that this was not an event she should attend. And, and then when she started reconsidering, I went out and found conflicts for her. And I actually went to defense and said, could you file a motion to keep Brenda in the hay? Now, now after the last dialogues, I think someone spilled, I blame Serge for spilling the beans and calling Brenda and saying what a wonderful event this is and why weren't you there? And so Brenda said, you know, I, I'm not falling for this anymore and I'm going next year. And it was at that point I figured out I had to do something different to get to the dialogues. <laughs> and so many may, may consider this extreme, but, but this is what I have done to make sure that I get to continue to come to the dialogues. But thank you, Brenda, for the first two times that I got to come to the dialogues. The moderator of this event, of course, also needs no introduction. And Michael, Professor Scharf, and the Frederick K. Cox Center has been a sponsor of the dialogues from the very, very beginning. They are co-sponsors, co-founders in some respects, but certainly a sponsor from the beginning, and we certainly appreciate that. So he de certainly deserves no, no, um, no introduction. And, and of course, I saw this today, great picture, Michael, on the, new, on the radio on talking foreign policy. That's great. So, so there is one thing, though, one thing that many of you may not know about Michael, and this is a good thing, Michael, along with all of the other things about Michael Scharf, the one thing that certainly I know and all of the prosecutors here setting know, and many of you may not, and so I'll tell you, but Michael is, has an endless supply of interns, of the highest quality interns that he has sent to all of the tribunals. And without those interns that Michael provides continually from the start, we couldn't have done our job at the courts. And it's those interns, and so for that, I thank you very much. And with that, I turn this session over to you. Thank you very much. And I'll make sure that I don't take any of your papers. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for those kind words. Well, this is the International Humanitarian Law Dialogues, and often the high point of the dialogues is the dialogues between the chief prosecutors and the, their deputies. Um, we've tried and experimented with various formats throughout the years, and for the last couple of years, we've had each of the prosecutors give you about 15 minutes of highlights of what their last year was about. What we decided this year is to go back to a format that's more interactive. And so we're going to be asking the prosecutors in order in which their tribunal was established to answer briefly, about two minutes or three minutes, a series of questions. And that will give us a comparison of what's going on with all of the tribunals, what their major challenges are, what they see coming up in the future, what the precedents they've set are. Now, you've met all of these people before, and they are so well-known in this field that I don't really need to go into bios. But I will tell you in order, we have at the far left, uh, the first tribunal that was created in modern times is now headed by Chief Prosecutor Serge Bremitz. Uh, second, after that, a year later, the Rwanda Tribunal was created, and for many years now, Hassan Jallo has been the esteemed chief prosecutor, and welcome back, Hassan. Um, then we go to the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and as you saw last night, there have been four prosecutors who have together seamlessly done a great job culminating in the recent uh, verdict against Charles Taylor, and we have the current and final chief prosecutor, Brenda Hollis. Then we have the Cambodia Tribunal, um, formerly known as the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, and we have seen in the past Andrew Cayley, but he was nice enough to send us somebody who was there from the very beginning, and Andrew says he works so hard, he absolutely needed this trip out to Chautauqua, so we welcome William Smith, Bill Smith. 
And then finally, the Lebanon Tribunal is the newest tribunal, and we are very happy to have it join the ranks of the other tribunals, and we have Eckhart Withop from Germany, who is one of the prosecuting attorneys there. So what we're going to do is start in... Oh, and wait, wait, and I didn't mean to skip, but of course, all of these ad hoc tribunals are situation specific, but then we have the permanent International Criminal Court and seated in the middle of all the tribunals um, where it was established in 2002. We are very, very fortunate to have the new Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Fatou Bensouda. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things Jim didn't mention are my eyes are going on me. And so, <laughs> okay. So let's start way over there with Serge, and we're going to ask the same question of everybody. Please keep uh, your comments brief enough so that we can get through this and then open it up to questions from the audience as well. So the first question is, what were the one or two most important developments of the Yugoslavia Tribunal during the past year? Yeah, as far as our tribunal is concerned, the most important development since uh since we met last time, is of course that finally Karadzic and Mladic are both on, on trial. For Karadzic, uh, the defense phase uh, will start in October, and for the Mladic trial, uh, the, presentation of, the presentation of evidence is, is, is ongoing. Um, we, we started uh, the opening statement uh, in May this year. Why is it very important? Uh, it is important because um, they were fugitives for many, many years. Uh, they have been uh, indicted for the first time in 95. Uh, Karadzic was arrested in 2008, Mladic in 2011, so they were fugitives during a very, very long period. And both are allegedly two of the most responsible uh, perpetrators of, of crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia. We consider in our indictment Karadzic being the, the architect of the policy of ethnic cleansing in, in Bosnia, and Mladic, the, of course, the, the highest military officer uh, general of the uh, Serbian Bosni Bosnian army. So in this sense, uh, I would say that's for sure uh, the most important development to have now both uh, on trial in The Hague. Yes, and with, with Milosevic's death, some people said that if those two had not been brought to justice, international law would not have remembered the Yugoslavia Tribunal as such a success. Um, so we look forward to seeing how those cases continue to unfold. So now going down into uh, the middle of Africa, the Great Lakes region, um, Arusha, Tanzania, um, tell us what's going on in your tribunal. Well, with the ICTR based in Arusha and with the conclusion of proceedings um, this month in the case of Augustine Girabatuare, the Arusha Tribunal, after some 17 years and after dealing with some, concluding some 72 cases, has finished the trial phase of its program. That's a significant development. We have no more trials to do, and all we are focusing on now is dealing with the appeals which have, which have arisen from, from those trials. We expect that the appeals themselves would conclude towards the end of uh, next year and latest, early 2014. Closely related to, the, to that, and I think what also helped in the conclusion of the trials is the fact that we were able, during this past year, to secure the approval of the judges for the referral of cases to Rwanda for the first time. Yes. That, there has been a, an ongoing attempt to do that, and uh, each time the, the judges declined for various reasons. But as a result of um, some law reform and capacity building which was carried out within the Rwandan legal system, we were able to finally convince the judges that the uh, uh, Rwandan legal system can provide fair trial opportunities. And so they have transferred a number of cases to that jurisdiction uh, for trial. Another, another uh, well, the second important development is the fact that as we are moving towards closure, the Security Council had decided that there should be a successor mechanism to the Yugoslav Tribunal and to the Arusha Tribunal. And so it, by a resolution uh, passed in December last year, 1966, re number resolution, the Security Council requested our tribunal and the ICTY to work towards the, the establishment of that residual mechanism by 1st July. We've succeeded and managed to get the residual mechanism off the ground since 1st of July this year, at least the Arusha branch of it. So it is functioning now, and the, the Yugoslav branch is expected to commence 1st July of, of next year. So there is a successor institution now in place.
to take over the residual functions of both the ICTY and the ICTR. Those have been, I think, our major developments. Now, Brenda, it's been a real quiet year at the Special Court for Sierra Leone, but surely something is worth talking about, right? Well, thank you, Michael, and I'll take that question for 100 points. Um, of course, the, um, the verdict and the sentence in Charles Taylor uh, was a very important milestone for the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Mr. Taylor uh, being found guilty of all 11 counts of the indictment for planning and aiding and abetting. And the sentence was very important because they gave this man 50 years for planning the most horrific campaign in a horrific campaign of atrocities against civilians, as well as being a critical contributor to the ability of the two rebel, major rebel groups to commit these crimes. It was, of course, of historical importance, of legal importance, but most significantly, it was of importance to the people of Sierra Leone because it basically confirmed and affirmed what they told us from the very beginning, that Charles Taylor was among those most responsible for these crimes and, in fact, in the view of many Sierra Leoneans, was the man most responsible for these crimes. So very important achievement there. We also have found over the last year that the legislature in Sierra Leone has ratified the agreement creating the residual special court for Sierra Leone, which will stand up when we close shortly after the appeals judgment in the Charles Taylor case, and that is expected in the last quarter of 2013. We have another significant development over the last year in that we have six persons who have been or are currently subject to contempt proceedings, including the former lead counsel, uh, defense counsel in the Charles Taylor case. Uh, that counsel is uh, before a judge for contempt because of violations, alleged violations of protective measures. The others are before the judges for violation of protective measures or attempting to bribe witnesses. This is very important because we need to send a message that witnesses will be free from interference even after the special court closes. And those who interfere with these witnesses will face judicial proceedings before the court. So I believe those are the, uh, the most significant accomplishments over the last year. Excellent. And now on June 15th, when she was sworn in as the new prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and uh, required for nine years to come back to Chautauqua, <laughs> the New York Times called Fatou <laughs> Bensouda the new face of international justice. What's been going on at the ICC this year? Um, that for one. Um, uh, but also, I think it, this has been a very important year for um, the International Criminal Court. Um, we completed the trial of Lubanga last year, and this year in March, the, pre the trial chamber found him guilty. Um, unanimously, it was a unanimous decision um, of being a co-perpetrator in the, the crimes of enlisting, conscripting, and using children under the age of 15 uh, to participate in hostilities. This is in connection with the um, crimes that took place in the Ituri uh, region in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo. And uh, I think that is significant in that it is the first um, trial of the International Criminal Court and the first decision, uh, final decision of the International Criminal Court, but also closely connected to that is that a decision on reparation was also later, later given by the International Criminal Court. I think those, these two events are, are very important and, and very significant. Um, another important event which I, I think is very worth mentioning is that in uh, July of this year, I think just about a few days after my swearing in, I received a delegation from Mali led by the Minister of Justice uh, coming to refer the case of Mali uh, since 2002, 2012, January 2012, 
to the ICC prosecutor for investigations and prosecutions. Uh, this is significant because this is the fourth African state that is referring uh, a situation to the International Criminal Court for investigations and prosecutions. And um, I, I think that it also shows what I always say that, um, on the contrary to what is being said, that ICC is targeting and focusing on Africa, I think this also demonstrates yet again the engagement of African states of, of the ICC. So I think these two events are very significant. Now, Bill, the international press seems to hang out in The Hague, and there's not as much of a presence down there in Cambodia, but big things are happening in Phnom Penh. Can you tell us about those? Yes, um, good morning. I think the most uh, significant thing that's happened at the um, Khmer Rouge Court or the Extraordinary Chambers in Cambodia is the start of the main case against the senior uh, leaders of Democratic Kampuchea. Um, I think, as, as many of you know, between 1975 and 1979, uh, the Communist Party of Kampuchea took over um, Cambodia and ruled it and, and basically uh, attempted a social experiment to rapidly change that society from a, uh, a capitalist society to a um, socialist, agriculturist uh, revolution. Uh, the cities were emptied within the first couple of days and uh, people were sent to labour camps and anyone that was perceived to be uh, a real enemy or a perceived enemy to those policies, those rapid policies, uh, were taken to torture centres and uh, many were killed and um, some were attempted to, to be re-educated. The ultimate result of that regime was uh, two million, approximately two million victims, about one million uh, were executed and the rest died of uh, starvation, um, uh, medical, uh, lack of medical help uh, and disease. And so that was about one third to a quarter of the Cambodia population. Uh, the trial of that case started in November last year and it's been continuing right up until August. Uh, we've heard 100 days of testimony. We've had uh, many, many documentary debates on uh, the evidence that was discovered from the period. Uh, similar to uh, the German cases, uh, there was a trail of paper, not as significant and not as uh, all-encompassing as the Germans, but by the same token has given us an idea of who were the, the people most responsible. Witnesses have been coming and telling their stories. So for the people of Cambodia to have the second in charge of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, the third in charge, and the seventh in charge on trial at the age of 84 to 86 is justice a long time coming. Uh, it's not over. It's a difficult exercise. Uh, we understand uh, the issues and the complexities that have been raised by Hans Carell in terms of setting up of the court. Uh, were the Cambodian judges, did they have enough experience? Were the, uh, were the courts independent enough to be able to run these trials? Uh, the UN have become involved. It's a marriage between the UN and the Cambodian government. And in relation to the second trial, um, we as a, as a prosecution team are trying our best to make sure that the evidence is on record as to um, the crimes occurring and the responsibility of these accused. And we think that the best way to counter um, perhaps criticism about whether this court should have been set up is to present evidence and lots of it to ensure that the, uh, that the trial, uh, if there are any convictions, it's done on evidence and the process is fair. It's a difficult exercise, but um, this is the big going concern in Cambodia. Uh, the people have waited 30 years for this type of justice. And so that's our concentration right at the moment. There's others going on. I'll address other aspects in, in relation to your further questions. Okay. Now, Eckhart, a year ago, everybody was abuzz about Judge Cassese's uh, decision, the first appeals decision out of your court, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, that defined terrorism. And unfortunately, one of the developments since then is that Judge Cassese, a dear friend of many of ours, has passed away. Um, so uh, for a second, I think, um, we should just have a moment to respect his passing. But 
Now, there have been many other developments this year, and we're very happy that you could be here today to tell us about some of the exciting news out of um, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, which sits in The Hague in the same building as uh, Brenda occupies um, on the south side of The Hague. Yes, indeed, there have been a series of quite important developments, and I believe the most important one is the decision on the trial in absentia that was taken by the trial chamber in early February of this year, and which has recently translated into a decision of the pre-trial judge on a trial date. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon is the sole tribunal amongst the currently existing international courts and tribunals that provides for trial in absentia proceedings. And of course, we do realize that as a matter of principle, they are problematic. It is, however, a very unfortunate fact that in the context of investigating the assassination of former Lebanese Prime Minister Hariri, there is no likelihood, no likelihood at all that one of the four defendants, and they are all supporters of Hezbollah, would be arrested in the foreseeable future. Based on this situation, the trial chamber after careful consideration of the steps that have been taken by the Lebanese authorities in trying to arrest the four accused, came to the conclusion that all reasonable steps have been exhausted. That was the requirement for deciding on a trial in absentia. That decision has been taken. The decision was appealed by way of motion for reconsideration by the defense the trial chamber for procedural reasons has dismissed such a motion and the issue is now before the appeals chamber. Nevertheless, in parallel, as mentioned, the pre-trial judge has scheduled a trial date. He very deliberately indicated that the trial date is a tentative trial date only. It's the 25th of March of next year. He added a number of caveats, the first one being a potential arrest. We talked about this. The second one being an amendment to the indictment which, which would include potentially connected cases. And the third one being adding one or more accused individuals. Whilst the first scenario is highly unlikely, I think the other two scenarios, adding charges and adding accused persons, are certainly within the range of possibilities. I only want to briefly touch upon on the decision of the trial chamber on the legality of the establishment of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon as it has been anticipated. The trial chamber came to the conclusion that the Special Tribunal for Lebanon was legally established. And as a last important decision, the pre-trial judge allowed 59 victims to participate in the proceedings. Now the next question is related to the first, but it zeroes in on the issue of legal precedent. People say that this field, international criminal law, is the fastest growing and evolving field of international law and maybe of any field of law. And that's because we have all these tribunals generating all these new cases. And luckily they're online, people can research them, and the students are taking international criminal law classes all around the world. It's one of the most hot and popular areas for students to take. So the next question is, what was the most important legal precedent set by your tribunal this year and, and explain why and, and what you think the precedent means for the greater development of international criminal law. We'll begin again with Serge. Thank you. Um, I would like to say a few words about the Perisic judgment um, from uh, September uh, last year. Uh, Perisic, he was the chief of staff of the Yugoslav army and as such uh, providing uh, logistical support to the Serbian army in Bosnia. So he was prosecuted for aiding and abetting um, crimes uh, committed in, uh, on the territory of, of Bosnia, crimes for which uh, many people have been convicted already in the past by, by the tribunal. Um, the trial chamber has um, uh, considered him, found him guilty for aiding and abetting those crimes, a number of specific crimes, a murder, inhumane acts, persecution, attacks on civilians, um, uh, aiding and abetting those crimes committed as uh, said by the, the uh, army in, in, in Bosnia. Uh, he was, however, uh, acquitted for aiding and abetting um, the crime of extermination 
in uh, Srebrenica because the trial chamber was of the opinion that the mens rea was not there at, at that level, that he was fully aware that there was uh, a policy of, of committing crimes, but not to the level of, of extermination or, or genocide. He was also convicted for, as a superior for uh, having failed to punish uh, those responsible for uh, crimes committed uh, by the shelling of, of Sarajevo. It was an important judgment, 27 years uh, was the sentence. Why is it important? Because it is partially precedent, I think so, which shows that providing uh, assistance to a party in the conflict by knowing that this party is implementing a policy in which crimes are committed, that this person can be prosecuted for aiding and abetting crimes. And we speak here about logistical support in the sense of paying salaries out of Belgrade, uh, providing fuel for, 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 for tanks, by providing training. And we're even not speaking about a uh, weapon in this, this, uh, in this case, because the trial chamber was of the opinion that uh, the evidence was, was clear that also a weapon had been provided by uh, uh, the, the chief of staff or people under his responsibility, but that there was no factual link established during the trial between the weapons which had been delivered and the crimes committed in a number of municipalities. So I think it's an important uh, development in this uh, sense that aiding and abetting is receiving, I think, a, a larger interpretation. Of course, uh, we have to wait for, for an appeals decision, but I think it's a, a quite interesting development. And Hassan, what would you say was the most important legal precedent at the Rwanda Tribunal? Uh, I'd say, if you'll permit me, that we had two very important decisions. Absolutely. I've already alluded to one of them, which is the decision by our judges to refer eight cases to Rwanda for trial, including the cases of two detainees. In doing so, the, the judges went to great length to really explain what are the requirements for fair trial, what they would be looking for in order to satisfy themselves that a particular, whether a particular legal system would provide the, the, the fair trial for an accused person. The cases, the decisions have, are very important in, in many respects. First, they, they've enabled us to finish our work by moving some of the workload from our, from our own, fire, from our own uh, court. Uh, secondly, it, the cases are important because they've also now enabled other jurisdictions which were in a situation where they could not prosecute or even extradite suspected genocidaires within their own countries, uh, now, now to be able to extradite them to Rwanda. Once the ICTR gave the the, 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 the go ahead, the, the go ahead, the green light that the legal system in Rwanda has can provide fair trial. Uh, since then, a number of jurisdictions in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, have been able to send suspected genocidaires to that country for trial. So the the gaps, the gaps in impunity, in combating impunity, uh, have been have been blocked to that extent that you no longer have the situation where some of these people will find safe havens in countries we will not extradite or, or prosecute. I think the decisions are important also in, in, third res, in the third respect for the ICC, because I think they provide a pointer as to what needs to be done if you are going to implement complementarity. What are the reform and capacity building measures you need to, to resort to in order to make sure that a particular legal system satisfies the conditions for, for fair trial. So it's been a good, it's, 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 it's a good series of, of decisions for us. Then we had the Karamera judgment also, which involved the prosecution of uh, two, two of the leaders of the then ruling party at the time of the genocide in Rwanda. The UN report, as you will recall, uh, on the genocide in Rwanda did uh, highlight the fact that sexual violence was a major weapon of the genociders, and that up to a quarter of a million women may have been subjected to it during those 100 days. We did indict these two uh, leading personalities, leaders of the MRND, with sexual violence, with rape, not as direct perpetrators, but based, based on the evidence that the Interamwe, which is the militia wing of their ruling party, was the main body responsible for the killings and the violence. And it, it was good to, to get to see the judges of the trial chamber agreeing and convicting these two leaders of the ruling party for rape and sexual violence committed by the members of the ruling party which they led on the basis that 
they should have foreseen, the leadership should have foreseen that sexual violence would be a natural consequence of the genocide which they had conspired and, and planned and implemented. It's been a good decision for the, for the struggle against rape and sexual violence to have these two leaders of the ruling party who had nothing practical, I mean they were not engaged in acts themselves, but they have been held legally responsible by the judges for all acts of rape and sexual violence committed and been sentenced to life for that. And Hassan's comments reminds us that the precedents that come out of these courts are not confined just to these courts. The different tribunals are looking at each other and are guided by the precedents that are coming out of each other and the domestic legal systems are starting to cite your case law on a regular basis. Um, now, Brenda, you were telling us about the Charles Taylor judgment. I know it's something, it's like over a thousand pages long. What in there would you say are the one or two most important precedents for the future of international criminal law? Well, I think first of all, just the conviction of a former head of state for crimes committed by others in another country, which this accused never entered during the commission of these crimes. And in relation to the uh, basis for his responsibility, in relation to aiding and abetting, I think it has the same consequence as Serge talked about with the Parasitch case. Uh, they found him to be a significant contributor, uh, substantial contributor to the commission of these crimes through his ongoing aiding and abetting. And I believe that was a very important uh, precedent. Uh, also, as Hassan has mentioned, Mr. Taylor, among other charges, was found guilty of rape and sexual slavery and outrages on personal dignity. Again, these crimes being committed by others, but they were committed with his involvement with the perpetrators, with the awareness that there was this ongoing campaign that included these crimes. So I think that that was, uh, was also very significant for us. There was another significant part of the case in that they had to deal again with sexual slavery and they refined the jurisprudence of the special court in relation to sexual slavery. In an earlier case, the prosecution had alleged forced marriage as one of the forms of sexual violence during the, the uh, conflict and the associated crimes. And what would happen is they would capture women uh, and girls, they would rape them multiple rapes at the beginning and then they would keep them and people would own them. And if you were lucky, you were owned by one person. But when that person no longer wanted you, then you were handed to someone else. And there was a dissent at the trial saying that this was forced marriage. And at the appeal, that dissent was upheld and so a conviction of forced marriage uh, was entered in, in that case for the first time. That dissent was upheld on appeal after we had begun in the Taylor trial to present our evidence. So we did not feel we would be able to go back and amend our indictment to include another crime. We proceeded with sexual slavery. And in the judgment against Charles Taylor, the judges again had to look at the jurisprudence now. Uh, and they determined that their analysis based on forced marriage was not really the factual characterization of what had happened or the legal characterization. And that what it really amounted to was sexual slavery with an additional component, and that was this forced conjugal association, this forced exclusive ownership that could be passed on. So they found Mr. Taylor guilty of sexual slavery with this component of forced conjugal uh, slavery. So I think that was very important. Uh, and I, I know over at the well. Cambodia Tribunal, there has been talk of. Um, prosecuting forced marriage of a slightly different kind where they would, the Khmer Rouge would force uh, husbands and wives to marry who didn't know each other or want to marry. Um, and they're looking very closely at the jurisprudence coming out of this and, and it's strong dicta. Um, it, it wasn't, as you said, it wasn't part of the indictment but they strongly said, we do not think that this case is about forced marriage. Um, now, Fatou, you're court has all of these pretrial chambers that are dealing with all these situations in addition to the judgment that's come down. It's going to be hard for you to pick, I think, the one or yeah. two most important yeah. precedents, but yeah. I'm interested in, in seeing what you prioritize. No, I think it's, um, I would prioritize the decision on reparation. I, I think this was um, a, a, very, a, a very significant legal um, development um, at the ICC. 
As you know, uh, victims' participation and reparation is a unique feature of the, um, of the Rome Statute and of the ICC. And following the Lubanga conviction, a decision on reparation principles and proceedings was uh, issued by the Chamber. This was on the 7th of August uh, this year. And the, the trial chamber ordered the, that the proposals that were being forwarded by the victims themselves, as proposed by the victims, should be collected by the trust fund for victims. And it should be submitted to the tr newly constituted trial chamber for approval. Um, as I said, this is the first time and also that this reparation should be implemented through the Trust Fund for Victims and the funds available to them. But again, uh, an important feature that came out was about who, who should be the beneficiaries of, of, this, uh, of the reparation uh, decision. How much money the are we talking about in ballpark? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> But it could be large sums. Um, it could be. It's, yeah. it's a large sum. It's a large sum of money. Uh, but the fact that both direct and indirect victims could also benefit. And by direct victims, it's those who suffered the harm. But indirect victims could also be members of their family. Uh, and they could also be persons who intervened to either help or to prevent the crimes from being, being committed would be the indirect victims. So I, I think that this is uh, happening for the first time, and I would prioritize that as being very significant. Excellent. Bill, what would you say is the one or two most important precedents, and, and how are they significant? Um, I would say, I mean, to, to understand perhaps some decisions that came down in the court in the last year and, and how important they are, or certainly opinions by the judges, um, perhaps I just can give a little bit of background in relation to the nature of the court and uh, how these pretrial chamber decisions came about, which were very important to restore um, faith um, in the ECCC, which has been uh, under uh, much criticism, even from the beginning. Many people thought that it shouldn't have been set up because it wasn't, uh, there wasn't the appropriate expertise, as, as we've discussed. Um, in the uh, ECC, it's a civil law system so rather than being common law where the prosecution and the investigation work together, um, there's an investigative judge that works separately from the prosecution, separately from the defence and from the trial chamber. And they investi investigate the case under the supervision of a judge. The prosecution and the defence request them to carry out activities, to pursue their interests, and then the case perhaps would eventually go to trial or be dismissed. Um, at the ECCC, um, we've had one trial, the person was convicted and on appeal um, that, uh, that remained. We've got the other trial that's happening now with the three main senior leaders of Democratic Campuchia and we have five other cases, five other cases under investigation um, of um, most people we think are most responsible for uh, the killings of hundreds and thousands of victims. That has been um, a thorn in the side of the Cambodian government in that uh, they've wanted to limit the prosecutions to the five. And uh, as a result of that, um, there's a, a symmetry or, or a harmony between the, uh, the Cambodian uh, side of the court in the ju Judicial Investigation Judge's Office. They don't um, assist in the investigations. And it's been, it's been a problem for the court um, to maintain um, the independence of the court and not have um, the government of the day decide who uh, will be prosecuted. Um, after the first investigative judge left, um, after three years, a new one was replaced and he was there for 10 months. And much to the surprise of the international community, uh, many of the decisions that were taken were consistent with uh, the prevailing opinion of the government at the time that these cases shouldn't be investigated. Um, and we thought the setup of the court being a UN and Cambodian setup, that the UN would make sure that uh, the judicial officials will carry out their functions, investigate, and not take instructions from the Cambodian government or the UN or anyone else. Um, unfortunately, with the second investigating judge, that didn't seem to happen. 
and it was a real affront to the, to the victims um, of the Khmer Rouge regime. It was a real affront to the, uh, the value of what a legal system is meant to be because many Cambodians know that their system isn't strong and it's not as independent as it should be. And they were expecting the UN, through their officials, to come in and make sure that the court is strong. And unfortunately, this investigative judge, um, his actions concurred with the uh, uh, views of the government at the time that there should be no further prosecutions for these five other accused, or five other suspects. Consequently, after four months, the investigative judge, the new second investigation, investigative judge closed the investigation after ordering the investigators to stay at their desks and not go out and investigate. They rejected applications from civil parties, which is one uh, valuable aspect of the civil law system that allows victims to participate as a party in the process. And they rejected applications which in relation to the first case and the second case, which would have been admitted. And if I can just briefly say, uh, family members of people that were killed or executed were viewed under the rules to be victims under the, under the jurisprudence and under the law. That many thousands were allowed in the first and second case to participate. We get to the third case and fourth case relates to these two five accused that uh, the government didn't want prosecuted and on the same grounds, those civil party applications were rejected. And so what that meant, that uh, no one would see um, that nothing was happening in relation to these prosecutions. And a, a number of decisions came down. We appealed, uh, we requested the investigative judge to carry out further investigations. You can't keep investigators in, in their office and then close the investigation after three interviews. You just can't do that. Um, we have a responsibility to, to investigate these cases. These, we appealed all of these decisions from the investigative judge and then that judge resigned <laughs> after 10 months um, under international pressure from international NGOs and local NGOs that um, he wasn't doing his job. It was an affront to Cambodians that the UN's representative wasn't performing their task. And so what does justice mean to them if that's the international standard? And so he resigned and uh, all of these matters were appealed. And over the last 10 months after his resignation, the pretrial chamber, which examines and supervises the investigation, um, the international component of it, there's three Cambodians, two internationals, the international component said, this is not right. This is not correct that you can come in and not investigate when you've been requested to by the prosecutor. It's not right that you can refuse applications from civil parties that are victims in the case and just say they are not victims. It was an affront to the whole um, makeup and concept of what this court was about. And even though precedent normally uh, comes from the majority, this came from the minority, but it was the two internationals speaking out to say this is not the standard, this is not international standard of justice. And that was really valuable for our court to restore credibility in the system that the international community, or at least the judges representing it, didn't support that international judge that sent uh, our view um, international criminal law or that the basic uh, ideas of uh, due process backwards. And so that put us forward again. And there's, there's more positive aspects to this story, but I'll perhaps save it for another question. Right, and the story, however, <coughs> reminds us that judges, especially in the international world, are not mere computers that, that put the facts and the law together, that there are human personalities and there's politics involved. And it makes these international tribunals extremely complicated places to work. Uh, now, our newest tribunal um, is represented by Eckhart here. Um, you had mentioned already the fact that the tribunal has decided to go forward with these trials in absentia. This will be the first international trial in absentia since um, Nuremberg, since Martin Bormann. 
And even the Yugoslavia Tribunal experimented for a while with these Article 51 hearings that some people characterize as mini trials of absentia, but they really weren't. So this really is precedent for international world. Is it, is it a good thing, do you think? <laughs> Obviously, you, you <laughs> I think I got the most delicate question. <laughs> Obviously, there are a lot of thoughts on trial in absentia. And the vast majority of the practitioners, and I concur with their views, see the downsides of trial in absentia. It is, however, a reality in a number of civil law countries, including Belgium, where our pre-trial judge comes from, and Italy. And it is, and that's the most important point, a reality in Lebanon. And for that reason, I think, it makes sense to have a trial in absentia, despite all the shortfalls. The question will arise, how will look a trial in absentia, how will it look like? Will it be a short paper trial of about three to four months? Or will it be a very long, fully fledged adversarial trial that may last two to three years, maybe even longer? And a consideration is the mere fact that council don't have clients. And if they don't have clients, they can run alternative defenses, which is, of course, a, mean to, a means to prolong the trial. It also has other consequences. It has consequences in respect of stipulations of facts. Council for the Defense at least put forward the idea that due to the lack of clients, they cannot agree to any fact one may take a different view on that proposition. We certainly do, but this has been put forward. And of course, it is a very weird idea to run a trial for two to three years in the worst seen scenario without any of the accused persons in the box. So despite the fact that there, is, there are very many good reasons to not conduct a trial in absentia, our law provides for it, and as you have rightly mentioned, it's not the first time the uh, International Military Tribunal, the Nuremberg Tribunal, provided for it, if I recall correctly, by Article 12 of its chapter, and Bormann was convicted, and he was convicted to death, sentenced to death by a trial in absentia proceedings. But, and now comes the main difference, at that occasion, the evidence was mainly based on documents, and the documents, they bore the signature of Bormann. In our case, as some of you may know, the evidence is mostly, mostly based on the analysis of call data records, which is a completely different story, and it remains to be seen how such a trial in absentia will evolve. Now they say to be an international prosecutor, you have to have a thick skin. And you have to be patient, and you have to be ready to work within this very complicated world of international justice. So, so far we've been talking about the most important developments and the most important legal precedents. Now I want to ask you to objectively talk about some of the most controversial things that are going on at your tribunal, the things where you maybe you're seeing some bad press or where you hope that a new direction will emerge. And we'll begin with Serge. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the most controversial ongoing uh, decision-making process, if I may say, is in relation to the Karadic trial. After the trial chamber a few weeks ago uh, took the decision based on uh, the Rule 98 bis to dismiss one count of genocide in the Karadic uh, indictment. For those who are not so familiar with uh, the rules of proceeding with evidence, uh, Rule 98 bis is, is a rule which is applied after the presentation of evidence by the prosecution, where the judges, before the start of the defense case, decide if there is a case to answer, where uh, there can already be acquittals for certain counts and uh, a trial taking place for others. So here, um, uh, what is controversial about the issue is that at this early stage of the proceedings, the uh, trial chamber has uh, taken this decision. In June, we have uh, appealed uh, this decision. And the, as I said, the controver controversy is, is really that we are of the opinion that um, the trial chamber has uh, applied a much too high standard at that mid-level 
uh, or a mid moment of the proceedings by, by almost requiring uh, the um, responsibility without any reasonable doubt, where of course the, the threshold to be used is if a reasonable trial chamber could, based on the evidence presented, uh, come uh, up with, 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 with a conviction. Uh, so we will see what, what will happen. As I said, we um, are of the opinion that the trial chairman has already at this early stage looked in, into the evidence, uh, given already way to the evidence, where of course we are of the opinion that the evidence has to be taken at his, his highest and that uh, a decision should have been taken uh, at, a, at a later stage. Uh, it is also uh, controversial because it is the first time there have been a number of trials where the uh, there were, have been two counts of, of genocide, one in relation to the ethnic cleansing in the municipalities in Bosnia between 92 and 95, and the second count of genocide in relation to the genocide in, in Srebrenica, where uh, in, in a few weeks' time, during a few, few weeks, uh, more than 8,000 uh, men and boys have been, been executed by, by Serbian forces in, in Bosnia. Uh, so in the, in the past, in, in, all, uh, uh, in all other trials, uh, including the Milosevic trial, uh, the uh, count one passed the uh, 98 bis uh, stage. Um, we have appealed because we are of the opinion uh, that also for, for strategic reason, if I may say, as of, of the prosecutor, even if it's, uh, I have to, 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 to say that so far in the past, none of the uh, prosecuted person has been convicted for this count one, for genocide in the municipalities. Uh, and we are of course of the opinion if there is one case or if there are two cases where there could be a chance, and we, we want the judges to really very carefully look into the evidence presented, then it's in relation to Karadzic and Mladic, which uh, bear the, the greatest responsibility in relation to the crimes committed. And it's of course a very important um, legal question for us. It's of course up to the judges at the end of the day to decide about responsibility, but we think that this decision has to be taken at the end of the entire trial after all the evidence has been, been presented. I think that's really the, the most controversial question ongoing currently uh, at our tribunal, and we hope of course that the appeal chamber will, will look carefully into this issue. Yes, most, most unfortunate uh, precedent. Um, Hassan, what are the recent developments that are keeping you up at night? <laughs> Uh, a few of them, there are a few. Uh, we, we, we've appealed against a, a decision acquitting a senior military officer of superior responsibility. The situation was that a number of soldiers had carried out, you know, massive killings. This officer was aware of them at the time, but he was not their superior officer. So he had the knowledge, but not the responsibility to, 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 to take action against them. Within a few days of this incident, however, he became the chief of army staff. He became the head of the army. And of course, he carried this knowledge with him. And as, as head of the army, we argued he carried with him the responsibility, therefore, to punish them. But the judges thought otherwise, and they've acquitted him uh, on that particular count. We have taken the matter on appeal, and we think the outcome may well be a greater clarification of the law relating to, to superior responsibility, because we think he had an obligation uh, having become their superior officer within a few days of the incident to have taken punitive measures and disciplinary measures against them. Apart from that case, because there, there continues to be some concern at, at um, sentencing. Uh, at sentencing, there is a perception on, on, by some that increasingly, the, whereas we've had a number of sentence, life sentences for genocide, Increasingly, the, the, the trial chambers are imposing sentences for genocide which are not really commensurate with the gravity of that particular offense. <clears throat> we, we've had a situation where, for instance, a chief of the gendarmerie was convicted of superior responsibility, and just uh, his sentence was the time that he had served in pretrial detention, 11 years. And that was considered uh, quite, quite, quite low. We've had another case where uh, again, a, a lo local government administrator was found guilty of, gen of genocide or aiding and abetting the killing of some 2,000 Tutsis in a particular church, and he's got 15 years for that. Again, th th there are concerns that really this is diluting the gravity of, of the offense of genocide. I mean, with sentences of 15 years, 20 years, etc. We have, on a number of occasions, of course, taken these concerns to the Court of Appeal, but they have they, they have not changed the, the, the position. 
We've tried to get uh, victims' views through victims' organizations heard in the Court of Appeal, and we haven't succeeded in that respect. But it's, it's one area of, of concern uh, that we have, that the sentences now seem to, to be on the low side and may not reflect the gravity of these offenses. And it is time, really, we also consider the plight of the victims, while it's even being concerned about the rights to fair trial of the accused, but also be concerned about the victims and survivors and making sure that perpetrators who are convicted are appropriately punished. And, and if that's a concern for you, the studies that have come out recently show that the sentencing in your tribunal is much harsher than any of the other tribunals, so I'm sure everybody shares that. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to Brendan and ask a question that I keep getting asked about the final day when the judgment was announced. Apparently the alternate judge said some things that were caught and, and broadcast the news and then afterwards said some very controversial things about the decision. And just probably a good time, you can add whatever else you were planning to talk about, but it'd be a good time to, to understand for us what was going on with the alternate judge, if you know. Well, this is the um, subject of one of the uh, defense grounds of appeal, so uh, I would need to be very circumspect okay. in my okay. comments. But at the conclusion of the uh, announcement of the unanimous judgment uh, on the merits in Charles Taylor, uh, the alternate judge expressed a personal view um, that was not, as I understand it, uh, broadcast, but was captured in draft form in a simultaneous transcription, and my understanding is that uh, the defense basically copied that onto a document and then handed out some copies of that at a, a, a press uh, at a press briefing afterward. The alternate judge's personal view was uh, very different than the unanimous decision of the three voting judges, and that became uh, a source of much discussion and controversy and as I said is the basis uh, for some of the grounds of appeal that the defense are, um, are advancing now. So certainly uh, a very um, unexpected, uh, unusual and controversial uh, expression of personal view by, by an alternate judge that the appeals chamber will have to address in, in deciding the appeal in this case. We uh, are appealing other uh, aspects of the judgment that we felt uh, were uh, controversial. Uh, many people would say you, uh, you got a 50-year sentence for basically what others characterize as an aiding and abetting case with some planning, and you got a conviction on all 11 counts. So why do you think anything is controversial? Uh, and of course, one of the things that we are uh, contesting at the appellate level is their failure to convict Mr. Taylor of ordering, even though throughout the judgment they found he instructed the perpetrators in various ways. They used the language instruction, they used the language imperative, and also talked about his critical role in the ability of the perpetrators to commit the crime. So we will be appealing. Um, they're finding he did not order, although uh, we will be arguing that the plain language of their judgment, uh, in fact, established uh, ordering. So that's a bit controversial. But I think in a broader way, the controversial aspect of this case is something that is known to the ICTY, certainly, and that is the politicization of the trial, the uh, conviction, and the sentence. And throughout the trial, the argument was that Mr. Taylor was before these judges not for anything he had done wrong, because others had done the same thing, um, but because he stood up to neo-colonialist Western powers, and that the court, in effect, were simply puppets of the neo-colonialist Western powers, and that was the only reason he was before the court. So uh, this uh, is something that happens often at high levels because they want to deflect attention away from the evidence and the law showing their culpability and put it in a political spectrum where they have been very successful in the past, and this certainly happened in the uh, Taylor trial. And uh, people are often willing to accept those uh, arguments, and there were people willing to accept it in this trial. They continue to accept it today. So I think perhaps that was the most controversial aspect of this case. But too, echoing what Hassan was talking about, the most negative publicity I saw about the Lubanga judgment was the relatively <coughs> short sentence. Um, was that something that you were concerned with, or, and are you appealing that? 
Um, it's definitely something that we are discussing um, in the office. Um, I, I think that um, to lend seriousness to these kinds of crimes, especially the crimes of uh, enlisting children under the age of 15 to receive a sentence of 14 years, I, I think it's, it's relatively on the low side. Um, even though if you look at um, precedents, I think apart from the Sierra Leone special court, uh, that sentence uh, had a sentence of 30 years and I think 50 years, um, it has been within this range if you look at other, other tribunals of 15 years. But we still think that um, with respect to the Lubanga trial and this serious charges, 15, 14 is on the low side. And the office is debating uh, at the moment. There are those, of course, who feel that you know, it should be left alone, it should not be interfered with. But there are others who feel very strongly about uh, appealing the decision. Um, we have time, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll debate it uh, thoroughly. Uh, I personally feel that it's on the, on the low side. And are there other and things that are keeping you up at night? This, this, is, this is one of those. But also, um, you would recall that this year there was the detention of the four ICC staff um, in Libya. Yes. Um, this was a development, I think, that shows not only the vulnerability of staff, but also the difficult circumstances in which uh, staff of international courts and tribunals have to operate at times. And uh, even though it was members of the defense team, and I think uh, uh, some from the registry, yet it also directly impacts the office of the prosecutor's work in the, in the field. Because you know that we are the first uh, organ, we are the first people that deploy to the field to get invested, to get, uh, um, co to collect information and to collect evidence. So this, this was, uh, I think it exposes uh, quite, quite a bit what the staff can be, can be confronted with. Um, we, we try to handle it at, uh, at a court level. I, I think this is what, what we should, we should do. Um, and we, we have taken certain um, responsibilities of also investigating you know, on the part of the staff what really, really happened. But I think it were very difficult moments in, in the court. It was very widely publicized. And there was no distinction as to what, which staff you know, was involved in this. It, it was the whole of IT, uh, ICC. And some chose to interpret it that ICC is actually not doing the right things in the field. So I, I, I think this was uh, uh, some moments that kept us you know, uh, awake. Um, another thing that is still keeping me awake, and uh, I think uh, other heads of organs, is related to resources, resources for the court. Um, I think over the years, uh, the court has been trying on this zero growth uh, budget of um, and managing with the staff and, and trying with the resources and trying as much as possible to shift resources to where we need it. Uh, but it is getting to that point where this will be difficult for the court to do it and also to be able to be efficient. Um, ICC is, is, is funded by the um, uh, contributions from the Assembly of States Parties, uh, the, the states, and we do appreciate and understand the difficult economic difficulties, I mean, the circumstances that the states are faced with. But at the same time also, if we do not have the uh, adequate resources uh, that we need to be efficient, we just will not be. And these are difficult um, discussions which we are trying to manage, but otherwise it will come up at the Assembly of States Parties. and. Uh, uh, it could be quite um, uh, a difficult time for, for all of us. So hopefully, um, with all the meetings that we're having, with all the uh, discussions we're having at the moment leading up to the ASP, we will be able to uh, find a way of making these discussions less tense and also taking into account the difficulties that the court is potentially going to face if the resources that we have for one or a few cases 
would be the same resources we would have for the increasing uh, workload of the court. This is keeping me awake. Your, your, the second story you told about the defense counsel um, reminds us that everybody, you know, from the chief prosecutors down, who have to go in the field, and all of you have done it, you've yes. very heroically and bravely done it, um, put yourself in a degree of danger. And in the ivory towers, it's easy for us just to say, well, yes, they're prosecutors, of course. But uh, recently, Paul Williams and Anna Tripani, who are back there, and I went to Libya mm -hmm. while the defense counsel were still in custody. Yeah. And I got a, a sense of what it's like to be in a place right after a civil war where the situation is tense and militias yeah. are surrounding each and every city. And, and I just have to hand it to you all to do that on a regular basis. It's very courageous. Um, now, both Bill and Eckert have already told us about very controversial things. Do you want to add more to that, or shall we go to the last question, because we're running short on time? But I'm happy to have you add to the controversy that's keeping you up at night. Um, I might just briefly add, um, there's two, two controversies, I think, uh, at the ECC over the last year. Um, maybe there's been different one in previous years. But, but one is in relation to the clash between law and politics, and one is just purely law. And in the last year, uh, we've had two investigative judges resign. And I've talked about the second investigative judge that resigned um, on the basis of a political pressure. Um, the difference between the resignation of the second investigative judge and the third one is that the second judge appeared to bow to political pressure and um, uh, didn't carry out the investigations and then left under the guise of I was under pressure, um, I had to leave. But he was conforming with it. The third investigative judge, in fact, was trying to do his job, was trying to investigate despite um, the government statements at various times um, that uh, these case, extra cases shouldn't be investigated. Um, however, um, he, that pressure was too much for him. And, and for a number of reasons, and, and things weren't going smoothly. Sometimes drivers weren't made, being made available for the cars to go out on investigations. Sometimes interpreters weren't being made available. Um, there was uh, dysfunction in the office between the Cambodians and the UN. Um, but however, the statute allows for the investigations to proceed, uh, for the uh, international investigator to still to carry out his job. But it was too, too much pressure, and he left after five months. Um, we, we come now to the uh, approval of the fourth investigative judge and maybe that's the magic number because with the Sierra Leone court I believe you had four prosecutors and you finally came out with a, with a great result but I think the first ones um, contributed to that great result and, and this, the, the reason why uh, I'm happy about the situation that's developed now is that this investigative judge that is coming to the court um, has had 15 years experience in mass war crimes cases at the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And I think um, if he can't make it work, I think that's when politics will win over law. But I think it's possible. I think people do make a difference. Leaders of offices do make a difference. And um, that's the positive end of this story, that the UN has decided to continue um, and push the idea that the court should be independent and rather than fold and say no more cases, um, they're deciding to may try and maintain the independence of the court. And we hope with his starting in the next, um, two, or uh, next two or three weeks that um, um, it'll be a very positive development. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens when a very experienced um, prosecutor, now becoming judge, um, a very good diplomat, um, can work with the Cambodian government. And it's things things can change, and, and we're, we're certainly viewing it that way. I, I won't talk about it, perhaps, but the, the severance order in relation to the, the second trial um, was, was quite difficult for the prosecution. Two months before the trial started, um, the trial chamber said this is the main trial against the three main leaders of uh, Democratic Kampuchea. We'll only prosecute, in this case, the forced transfer, moving the people out of the cities to the countryside against their will, but we won't prosecute the killings, the torture, um, forced labour, um, forced marriage. That will happen in a second case and a third case. So it's not that they're saying they'll never be prosecuted, but we'll prosecute it in a, in a second case, because this will make it shorter. 
Um, we objected to that. We weren't able to be heard on that order to prosecute a case of forced transfer or torture or murder in some respects can be the same because the proof of the linkage evidence um, and the jurisdictional elements takes the same amount of time. And our complaint was, if you're going to pick a crime or a representative crime to make the trial shorter, and we agreed with that, we can't have trials going forever, make them serious, make them representative of the crimes that occurred. Because we don't believe that the international community will support, and we've told the trial chamber this, a second trial. Um, our view is that the international community says basically you have one chance and get it right because they're expensive. These trials are very expensive. And if you reduce it down to the most representative, um, horrendous examples of what happened, it can take the same amount of time as prosecuting the forced transfer. And that was our concern. We've uh, asked them to reconsider and then they said no. Then we asked them again and they said no. And we've asked them the third time and they're starting to say yes, and hopefully in the next week they will say yes. And um, so we've gone back, but we're going forward, and that's the positive end of, of that story. Now, I don't know if you're um, Cambodian and international judges, uh, if this will resonate with them, but I would say to them two words, Al Capone, <laughs> for those of you who know the reference. Okay, let's go, Eckhart, to... Um, any other controversies that are plaguing the Lebanon Tribunal? Yeah, mindful of the time, I will limit my observations to two aspects. The first one is unfortunately uh, in respect of victim participation. The Office of the Prosecutor of the Special Tribunal of Lebanon is very much in favor of victim participation, but it is a decision of the pretrial judge that makes it very difficult for us. We face a situation that the pretrial judge has decided in his decision allowing 59 victims to participate, that he has also decided that the victim participation applications remain ex parte, meaning that neither the defense nor the prosecution get to know the identities of the participating victims at this stage. And this, of course, is of a major concern to the office of the prosecutor against the background of a rule in our rules of procedure and evidence that states that participating victims only as an exception can testify as prosecution witnesses. We are facing a situation that we are getting closer to the filing of the pretrial brief and we don't know who the participating victims are. And the pretrial judge was of the view that in respect of all participating victims prior to revealing the identities of the victims, the victims and witness unit must undertake a risk assessment and I have a serious difficulty to understand how it can be that the office of the prosecutor poses a threat to victims. <coughs> this is a particularly difficult situation for the office of the prosecutor at this stage. It's, sort of, it's the other side of the coin of what Fatou was saying about the reparations decision and, and you're dealing with the downside of victims' participation. That's exactly right. And again, the Office of the Prosecutor is in favor of victim participation. And one should also consider in our particular situation, which is quite different from the ICC, where the number of victims are the real problem. In respect of our, of our situation, is, it is the question, who are the participating victims? And if you think about the main target of the attack of 14th of February 2005 against former Prime Minister Rafi Kariri, and if you consider that family members are entitled to participate, you can easily imagine that we have an interest to get to know who the participating victims are. There's one other aspect I want to briefly touch upon, being mindful of the time, and that's uh, looking ahead. We will face a situation probably in the not too far away future where our presumably the trial chamber, will have to take a decision on the admissibility of call data records. Our evidence is mainly based on the analysis of call data records, and the Office of the Prosecutor and its predecessor, the UNICC, has obtained billions of call data records, and of course the big question will arise, how is it about the tension with privacy rights of the individuals concerned? This is a decision to come, and I think it will have quite some impact on future prosecutions. 
Oh, I see David subtly pointing to his watch, and even though we started late, I think because the meal has to start on time, we have to start to think about um, closing up. Um, I do want to give each of you a chance to briefly address the last question, which is the issue of looking forward, and that is, what are the biggest challenges that you think you will be facing in the future? For the ad hoc tribunals, um, what are the tra challenges of transitioning to a residual mechanism? Um, Hassan Jallo, in particular, I want to hear about the best practices manual that you've been working on. So if we can just go down and very briefly touch upon that last question, we can still get out in time for lunch. Thank you. Two, two elements in this regard. Of course, completion strategy is for uh, the tribunal who will close soon uh, a, a big issue. We have still trials and appeals ongoing in relations with 35 people, but we are in the downsize mood, so we are, uh, our budget is, is of course uh, going down. We have less and less uh, stuff uh, working at the tribunal, so this is for sure one challenge. It's the same challenge. At the same time, we are uh, working towards the residual mechanism, making sure that our, our databases, our, our 7 million uh, documents within our OTP database will be, will be ready to move to the so-called residual mechanism. Uh, so a lot of work has to be done in this regard. Luckily, the uh, Security Council took a very wise decision to appoint my, my brother Hassan as prosecutor of the residual mechanism, so all the problems in this regard will, from our tribunal, <laughs> shift to his uh, very uh, responsible hands. Um, what I see as a uh, sec second element is really, you know, very soon, um, two years' time, perhaps our tribunal will close its doors. Uh, with 161 indictments in total, uh, it's, it's not too bad, I think, as a record, but it's very little in comparison to the number of perpetrators which still have to be prosecuted in the region. So uh, one of our priorities and our, uh, where we are very concerned about is the continuation of uh, war crimes trials in the countries of former Yugoslavia, especially in Bosnia, where there are hundreds of trials still to be conducted, where we also consider that our uh, support in terms of capacity building uh, over the next uh, years will be, will be instrumental. Thank you. Hassan, tell us about this best practices manual project. Yes, I think one of the challenges that the ad hocs have, not just the ICTR, is to make, make sure that they do pass on a legacy to succeeding generations which will be involved in investigation and prosecution of these types of crimes. And collectively, as prosecutors in 2006, we, we decided that maybe one of the best ways to do this is for us to try and document the best practices for the investigation and prosecution of these kinds of offenses, all aspects of it. What are the do's and the don'ts, what have been the successes, what have been the challenges, what have been the failures. Uh, with the help of our staff, we have now an almost final draft manual uh, of best practices in this particular area, which should be a guide for national prosecuting authorities, for international prosecutors, but more particularly for the ICC. ICC, which is just coming now into the, into the area, could benefit from our successes and our not so successes as well. I mean, some of the difficulties that we've had. Um, this will cover, as I said, all aspects of our work. Uh, and and uh, we, we hope to actually adopt the best practices manual in November uh, at a meeting in Bangkok in, in November, and then it will then become, become available to the ICC and all others in the field. But speaking specifically about the ICTR and the residual mechanism, we do have challenges, of course. Even though we've now concluded the trials of more than 70 accused persons for genocide and related crimes, we still have three top-level fugitives who are at large, and that's a major challenge for us, or for the residual mechanism, because we've passed those files from the ICTR to the residual mechanism. And it's the task of that mechanism now to, to track them and make sure they are arrested and brought to justice. There is good information about their whereabouts. It's Kenya for Kabuga, it's Zimbabwe for Piranha. Bizimana, they are, Bizimana in the, is in the situation that, where he has currently two graves <coughs> situated in two different countries. <laughs> following reports that he had died. And of course, the story is not very credible, so we have to track him as, as, as well. But that's a major challenge. And neither Kenya nor Zimbabwe is being very cooperative on these matters. And, and we, we continue to hope that the Security Council and some of the big actors on the international scene will put enough pressure on them for them to collaborate with us to make sure that these people are brought to justice. Part of the work of the mechanism also, of course, is passing on the archives 
I mean, there is enormous documentation created in the process of these trials. It's estimated that, for instance, for the ICTR, we would have some 2,000 linear meters of documents. That's like two miles of documents in some 15,000 boxes, etc. And all this has to be sorted out. We have to decide what should be retained, what should be destroyed, what should be retained under what conditions of confidentiality, who would ac have access to it, uh, bearing in mind the need to protect witnesses on the one hand, and also the need to provide uh, avenues for researchers, access for researchers, and also access for uh, national prosecuting authorities which may want to access our database. So that's one of the tasks which we are, which is actually keeping us uh, very, very much uh, busy at the moment. Can I get news bite-sized answers from the yes. remaining four panelists? Sorry. Okay. Starting with Brenda. Bite-sized. Bite -size. Uh, the biggest challenge we face is the completion of our judicial mandate, as well as the ability to take all actions that are necessary to transition to the residual court, including our archiving protocol uh, access <laughs> for the archives, doing all of that in the face of, of very uh, significant budgetary challenges and also looking toward the residual mechanism to ensure that there are adequate mechanisms and funding in place that the court will have the mandate and the ability to continue its obligation to protect witnesses and sources. We can't outsource that, and we need to be able to be sure that we can protect that. Those are, are the biggest uh, challenges that, that we are facing. Thank you. Fatou? Um, independence, yes. one, of the court. I think this is, a, this is a challenge that the ICC faces. And um, like with other courts, but uh, especially with ICC, we shouldn't take this for granted. And what we have, uh, what we are finding, is that national or community interests um, uh, pro provide sometimes incentives for states to uh, um, try to strengthen the oversight, you know, prerogatives. And and this leads to controlling, controlling the court. You know, we have issues of uh, governance, budget, and all these <coughs> staffing issues that. Uh, uh, may be uh, possible manners to, to exercise control. And even though this, we know that are accepted practices in the, in, in the international arena in, in various ways, I think this will harm the system that has been established by the Rome Statute. It should not be applied to the, to the Rome Statute. And I believe that without the independence of the ICC, we might as well close shop. And the second one is isolation isolation of the court. Uh, one, something that is becoming a reality is that those who are sought by the court um, blackmail the international community by threatening to commit more crimes. And I think political leaders should focus on how to, to make this balance. Of, and uh, if, if, this, if this doesn't happen also, we tend to go along with this blackmail and then in the end the court becomes uh, isolated. And the third one is on cooperation. I cannot emphasize it more. And I'm very grateful to the presentation this morning by uh, Hans Corral on that. The court needs cooperation to be able to be effective. I, I don't think I need to say anything more. Excellent. Now Bill, everything about your job <laughs> is a challenge. <laughs> do you wanna? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and do someone. a soundbite version. Um, our biggest challenge is time. I think you know, all of our challenges and everything we do is time, but uh, our accused, the, the main leaders, are uh, between 84 and 86 years of age. So we need to go fast with the prosecution. We plan to uh, finish it by, um, by uh, August next year. Um, but we can't, trials must be fair and expeditious. We can't uh, um, forfeit uh, um, the fairness of the trial just to obtain the speed. So uh, the judges, the prosecutors um, need to step very carefully and very quickly over the next 12 months to get it right. And um, I, I think the, the, the role of this court in providing the example to Cambodian courts when you were in trial, evidence, process, 
um, is very important to help build the rule of law in the country. We've developed a, a similar book taking the lead from the best practices um, in relating to getting the jurisprudence of this court and relating it to their local, their local legislation. So it's, it's a very unique opportunity that we have. It's not perfect, I, I completely agree, but people can make a difference. People in, in all their respective positions can make the trial fair. And so we'll have lots of headaches, but we're going to step as fast as we can and we hopefully will look back and we'll hopefully we'll see that we've obtained justice for the victims of the Khmer Rouge, but not produced a show trial. That's our aim. And Eckert, you're going to have the last word, but then Brenda's going to do a special presentation before we all leave for lunch. Go ahead. One of our biggest challenges, and you will not be surprised to hear that, considering that the opposing party, in quotation marks, is Hezbollah, a terrorist organization, uh, is witness protection. Without me going into any detail, you can imagine that there are concerns that witnesses will be prepared to come to court and testify. And we are thinking about alternative means for witness protection in close cooperation with the registry's victims and witness unit. The other challenge, and I touched on this briefly, is the question as to how the trial will unfold. At this stage, there are too many uncertainties for the Office of the Prosecutor to prepare. We prepare for all scenarios that are currently within the range of possibilities, and we would hope that sooner or later we will get a better idea from the pre-trial judge, from the trial chamber, on how they consider a trial should unfold in a trial in absentia situation. Well, this was an extraordinary panel, um, and I think we all have some real new insights. Before we adjourn, Brenda, if you'll come up here. There's a, a long-standing tradition at the Special Court for Sierra Leone that was established by David Crane, and that is for outgoing members of the Office of the Prosecutor, we have an OTP plaque that we give them. And over the years, it's become a much sought after plaque. Very few have it, they have it proudly. Uh, but we've established another tradition, and that is when the prosecutors leave, we give them a different and a personalized plaque for their service at the court. Uh, Jim Johnson has told you he was at the court for nine and a half years, and he was a mainstay of the Office of the Prosecutor. And so we made an exception and we had one of these personalized plaques made for Jim uh, as a, a mark of our real respect for, for the impact of his work on our ability to function. Uh, but you know, some people are never satisfied. And so we gave him this wonderful plaque, made the exception, and it was, yeah, that's nice, but you know, I want that plaque, that much sought after <laughs> plaque that everybody else gets. So we appreciate Jim very much. We know he can be difficult. And so we decided <laughs> we will humor him. And so I have today brought for him his own much sought after plaque that most people from the Special Court for Sierra Leone get. And so I want to give that to him today. This Well, gosh, uh, thank you very much, Brenda, and to the court. And, and, and one of the few times, for those who know me, I can say I'm speechless. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you very much. This means a lot to me. And for those of you who have it, this means an awful lot. And I, and I love the other plaque. Don't get me wrong. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. Okay, let's have a big, big round of applause for Michael and our panel today. That, that certainly gives a good, good insight into the last year and what's been going on in the tribunals. And, and very, very importantly, what's coming. 
and the concerns at, that, that the prosecutors have for the future, whether it be more of a near-term future for the ad hoc tribunals that are looking at winding down their business, or a long-term concern for the International Criminal Court. And so it is great to have them here. And, and again, thank you very, very much. Um, I will now ask you to make your way over to the Athenaeum Hotel for lunch and the lunch program. We are very excited about our lunch program today. For those of you who ate breakfast, you know, it'll be in the same room. For those of you who are joining us, it will not be in the main dining room, but the room just across the lobby from the main dining room is where we'll have lunch. And for those of you joining us, you can pay for your lunch at the, at the desk in the lobby. Thank you very much. I love those things. Right, that's, that's great. great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a good way of doing it. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. pictures. Well, we didn't get to the Q&A for the audience. I think they're kind of desperate for Q&A, but it, 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 it went well. And I like this format. I do too. This we one you can swing a little more. Well done. Thank you. I think I've got one of those somewhere too. I, I would hope so. <laughs> Congratulations, Jimmy. I was wondering, are you going to get one of the players? I've got senators who have that. No, they don't need to get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I've got one of those. Every time you see him on TV, he's sitting in the front of the track. That's right. Well deserved. Yeah, you need to, yeah, to that side. They look always